Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself Marta, where as always I am here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Today we are going to kick things off with a couple of somethings from AMD, the first of which is regarding the 7nm Zen 2. So AMD had a earnings call today and we will actually discuss the earnings themselves in just a few minutes, but AMD also confirmed that we will be seeing 7nm epic ROM processors in Q3 of 2019. Now interestingly they also confirmed that this is actually going to be the first place that Zen 2 7nm is going to be seen. So basically we're going to be seeing epic ROM on 7nm come first and then we're going to be seeing the desktop Ryzen 3000 CPUs get it afterwards. Now, it's probably going to be in the same quarter, but we are going to be seeing the 7nm Zen 2 come to Epic ROM processors in Q3 2019. Now, really interestingly as well, they also confirmed that Radeon Navi is going to be launching in Q3 of 2019. And as you may recall, this lines up perfectly with all the rumours and reports that we have discussed previously, and now it has been officially confirmed by AMD. And I also have a statement here from the CEO, Lisa Su. And she said, quote, Turning to our next generation Rome processor, we made excellent progress in the quarter, achieving key production milestones with our largest OEM and cloud customers. We're very excited about the performance of Rome, which is on track to deliver four times the floating point performance and double the compute performance per socket compared to our current generation Apex processors. We are on track to begin Rome production shipments in the second quarter to support a third quarter launch. Now we don't know how big the gap is going to be in between Epic releasing and the desktop Ryzen 3000, of course you've got Threadripper to consider as well. We just know that we're going to be seeing the 7nm Zen 2 come first to Rome and then to Ryzen 3000. But this was an earnings call, so naturally they talked about their earnings and we do have some financial results here from AMD, which I can talk about now as you might have guessed. So we see a gross margin expanding here for AMD to 41%. This is up five percentage points year over year. And revenue for the first quarter of 2019 was at 1.27 billion, operating income of 38 million and net income of 16 million and diluted earnings per share of zero. 0 0.01 so you guessed it one cent now interestingly enough this has actually beaten analyst expectations as analysts had expected AMD to post earnings of five cents per share on revenue of 1.26 billion so they have beaten their Q1 earnings and as a result they have seen a surge in stock but in terms of the actual nitty gritty of the Q1 2019 results, there is quite a bit more to discuss. As I said, that revenue of 1.27 billion, which was down 23% year over year due to lower revenue in the computing and graphics segment. And in terms of that segment specifically, we also saw revenue of $831 million, which is down 26% year over year and 16% quarter over quarter. And revenue was lower year over year due to lower graphics channel sales, but was partially offset by increased data center GPU and client processor hardware sales. And you guessed it, I also have a bit of a statement here from Lisa Sue as well about their financial results and she says quote we delivered solid first quarter results with significant gross margin expansion as Ryzen and Epic processor and data center GP revenue more than doubled year over year we look forward to the upcoming launches of our next generation 7 and MPC gaming and data center products which we expect to drive further share gains and financial growth and they also, of course, have revealed some of their expectations for what we're going to be seeing in the second quarter of 2019. Now, they're expecting their revenue to be roughly in the ballpark of 1.52 billion. And this is with a slight leeway of about, oh, of just $50 million. But this is an increase of roughly 19% sequentially and a decrease of roughly 13% year over year. But they are expecting to see growth across all areas of the business. And the year-over-year -year decrease is primarily going to be driven, or at least if it goes per expectations, lower graphics channel sales, negligible blockchain-related GPU revenue, and lower semi-custom revenue as well. But 
We're going to finish up with AMD, sort of, now, as we have some news regarding the PlayStation 5 dev kit. Now, as we've discussed numerous times, we finally learned our first concrete information about the console thanks to a recent interview done by Mark Cerny with Wired.com. And now, apparently, the dev kit is already in the hands of select developers, and if these leaks are to be believed, this console does not mess around. Now, a fellow by the name of Benji Sales, who has proven himself to be reliable in the past when it comes to inside information, recently tweeted that the PlayStation 5 dev kit is running a 13 teraflop GPU. Now, understandably, he took down this tweet, but not before people could grab screenshots of it. And the full tweet, as you can see on screen, reads, quote, It's looking like the PS5 is running a nearly 13 TF GPU, pairing with a Zen 2 CPU, and hopefully a ton of ultra-fast RAM, and it's a beast. Next-gen games from Naughty Dog, Gorilla, Santa Monica, Insomniac, etc. are going to look absurd. Look what they accomplished on base PS4. And interestingly, this does also line up with previous rumours. This has been very consistent when it comes to the performance. For example, yesterday we heard rumours that we're going to be seeing 56 CU at 180, sorry, 1800 MHz, 8 core Zen at 3.2 GHz, 24 gigs of RAM, and of course ray tracing and the 12.9 T-flops instead of the 13 that we see here. Now obviously... He's most likely rounding up, or the 12.9 could be slightly inaccurate, or both could be inaccurate, of course. As with anything unconfirmed that hasn't been you know, officially come from the mouth of Sony in this case, we should obviously take it with a pinch of salt. But if these rumours are true, and they are, again, very consistent, but as this is a dev kit, we should keep in mind that specs will and can change at the last minute, we should obviously not get a hopes up, but this is definitely really, really promising. But speaking of specs, I'm actually going to finish up with a confirmation about the Valve Index and what's going on there. Now, you may recall that recently we did have that accidental reveal of some of the specifications of the Index VR headset, but now we have the full unveiling of, of, the, of the headset, sorry, should I say, as well as the controllers, and they're going to be available for pre-order pretty much from today, and they're going to be bring, sh begin shipping on July the 1st. So... Let's talk about the price, $499, which comes with two base stations, which will be required unless you already have the HTC Vive with the controllers. Now, if you want a full Valve Index kit, that is going to set you back an eye-watering $999, which is oh, not exactly cheap, I'm sure you'll agree, but let's talk about the actual specs here. So the headset and the new base stations that I've mentioned. So we see a 1440 by 1600 resolution per eye, which is the same as the Vive Pro. We see custom full RGB display with 50% more subpixels than OLED. Persistence of 0 0.330 microseconds, which increases sharpness during motion, high FOV with custom lenses, high geometric stability, obstacle canting, which, quote, balances inner and outer FOV, 120Hz refresh rate with a, quote-unquote, experimental 144Hz mode. It's also backwards compatible with games which are designed for 90Hz screens, built-in speakers, and modability through, quote, front USB space and stereo cameras. And base stations 2.0, which are basically the sensors you have to mount in your play area, and they have longer range as well as a wider FOV, FOV, excuse me, I'm sorry. Now Valve is also making the claim here that it's the very first headset to get lens adjustment right. Obviously, whether or not that turns out to be true is probably going to be your mileage may vary, but I think the key question is how is it going to be for glasses, whereas that is a main concern for a lot of people who do have you know, bad short term, short range vision. Definitely something worth trying out before you buy if you do happen to wear glasses. As I'm, myself, I have found the, the VR headsets to be a little uncomfortable and pretty much push my glasses against my face, which, as you might expect, not exactly a fun time. But we also have a little bit to discuss about the controllers themselves. They are known as Knuckles controllers, and they don't have button presses. They have 87 sensors per controller, which, quote, optical motion capture and force. They use those things to figure out what your hands and even individual fingers are doing. If this turns out to be as much as they're hyping up to be, the impressiveness of this could be very damn high. 
but they also have standard buttons and a thumbstick as well as the sensors. This is one of the things they're really hammering home with this headset is the fact that it has to be backwards compatible because obviously older VR games are not going to be made for the sensors. I'm not going to know what to do with those sensors. So you don't have to worry about not being able to play a VR game you bought like two years ago on this fancy new controller. Now that also is in the base stations as well, which again are the sensors. They also work with the Vive Pro. And again, the Valve Index and the Index controllers will work with the older base stations as well. So if you do already have a Vive, you can save yourself a bit of cash. So we have various pricing tiers. I've given you the two most expensive as we're, oh, sorry, yeah, the, sort of the middle on the top most expensive, I suppose, is a better way to phrase it. So we have the full VR kit, which again is $1,000 essentially. And the index headset and controllers is $749. Headset standalone is $499. Just the index controllers is $279. And just the base station 2.0 is $149. Now, just with this in some sort of context, the Oculus Rift is about $700. And the Vive is $500. But the Vive Pro is $1,400. So it doesn't quite go as high as the Vive Pro, but this is still pretty expensive. But VR has yet to really solve the cost problem that I have discussed pretty much ad nauseum at this point. I'm sure you guys are sick of me bringing it up because one of the reasons I feel at least that VR has failed to really set the market alight. I mean, it's doing okay, but it's not set the world on fire like a lot of people hoped, is the cost of the headset itself and of course, the fact that you have to have quite a bit of space to actually use it properly, especially in the case of the Index and the Vive. And the fact that you have to have a pretty damn good PC to run VR without feeling sick on top of that. So I'm going to wait and see on reviews on this one. It's definitely going to be interesting to see what Valve's first real stab at their own VR headset is going to be. Of course, the HTC Vive has kind of been their Steam VR headset until now. So definitely going to be one to watch, but the cost definitely raises an eyebrow, but not exactly in a surprising way, just like, hmm, definitely going to be for the enthusiast, at least at first. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.